our January meeting and Happy New Year. Um, we have two board members who are en route, uh, so we're going to go ahead and start our um, non-voting business and we'll have quorum soon to move forward with the rest of it. So, um, yep. Okay. yep, so if we can please rise for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. You can bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we have together. Uh, thank you for this new year and that each decision that we make for the students, for the faculty, for the staff, and for our community play into your plan. Please let us have these meetings with civility and, and productive action and work to your good each and every day. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first uh, retirement resolution is Kimberly Philos. Oh, she's running late. Uh, Bonnie Fairbank. We certainly know that Bonnie is truly loved. <laughs> she has her posse up here with her. So I'm going to read said resolution. Bonnie Fairbank began her career as a business office manager in 2002 at St. Petersburg College's Allstate Center. And whereas Ms. Fairbank proved to be a competent and dependable professional and was transferred to the Seminole campus in 2003 to work on the PeopleSoft Student Administration System where she played a key role in configuring the student financials module. Whereas Ms. Fairbank successfully completed her assignment on the Seminole campus and was transferred once again to the Epicenter where she implemented a fully automated online payment plan for students. She soon became known as an expert in processing resolutions, student financial module configuration, and fee verification, making her a highly valuable financial resource in the Department of Business Services. And whereas Ms. Fairbank has a strong work ethic and has always been willing to do her best to support her colleagues and the students she serves. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college by Ms. Bonnie Fairbank and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. Said resolution being adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees, St. Petersburg College, this 21st day of January 2020. Ms. Fairbank. I want to thank you for the privilege that I had to work here at St. Petersburg College. It has become a part of my legacy that I'm going to leave to my family and friends. And when I first came here, I came and it, I had coworkers, and then my coworkers became my friends, and then they became my family. And um, I'm going to miss um, them very, very, very much. And I just want to thank Mike. Where's Mike? <laughs> he has been the best um, boss ever. Um, he's been my only boss up until about a, a year ago. <laughs> but um, he led me through, we had some good times, hard times, but he always led with grace and integrity and support. And I can't thank you enough for all that you taught me and um, the, the confidence that you had in me. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Um, Patricia Miles. Is Patricia here? Oh, yeah. She's coming. Yay, welcome. It's crowded this morning in here. I didn't know to bring my posse. <laughs> we know you have one. I do. That's, that's right. How are you? Good, good. good. There we go. Said resolution. Whereas Ms. Patricia Miles began her career as a pre-admissions assistant at the District Office of St. Petersburg College in 2014, and whereas Mrs. Miles' outstanding work was quickly rewarded as she was promoted to a pre-admissions advisor in 2015. Two years later, she became a recruiter on the Clearwater campus where she developed strong and lasting relationships with students, faculty, and staff at local high schools. And whereas Ms. Miles also reached out to the community organizations on behalf of St. Petersburg College, embracing leadership roles in many of them, thereby honoring the college by sharing her many talents and skills at public events held throughout the Clearwater area. And whereas Ms. Miles, a warm and caring person, has throughout the years demonstrated a remarkable capacity for organization as well as a strong and deep loyalty to St. Petersburg College and those in the community college that the community serves, that the college serves. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college by Ms. Patricia Miles and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. Said resolution being adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees St. Petersburg College this 21st day of January 2020. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I, I have to say that my tenure here was very short, but it was my love of labor, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed it so much. I uh, was born and reared in St. Petersburg, and to see the growth and to see what St. Petersburg College means to this community was heartfelt by me every day. That's why I loved coming to work every day. And as Bonnie said, everyone here is a family member and a friend, and I've made so many friends, and it was so supported by everyone. It feels good to come to work every day and know that we're all on the same page. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Velos is here. <clears throat> She's on her way here too. <laughs> we'll give her a minute. I think she stepped into the ladies' room. Said resolution, whereas Kimberly Philos was an adjunct instructor in the humanities and Greek mythology for several years before becoming the first full-time humanities faculty member on the Tarpon Springs campus in 1984. And whereas Dr. Philos has always been a highly sought after instructor, for she embodies an adventurous spirit, having traveled extensively throughout the world to study the arts and intellects of past and current global cultures. And whereas Dr. Philos has created courses, both credit and non-credit, to meet the needs of the college and the Tarpon Springs community. One of those courses, Ancient Greek Mythology, received special recognition from the Florida University Curriculum Committee for its role in preserving Greek culture in the campus service area. 
And whereas Dr. Filos has brought honor and distinction to the college through her active participation in community activities, including as an instructor in a Greek bilingual program, lectures at the libraries, and conference presentations. She was named Distinguished Bayless Professor of Greek Culture by the American Federation of Greek Language and Culture. Her international reputation as an expert in ancient Greek humanities is highly respected by her students, her peers, education leaders, government officials, and journalists throughout the state and nation. And whereas Dr. Philos was instrumental in helping to establish St. Petersburg College's reputation as a national leader in study abroad programs at community colleges, she was one of the first college instructors to embed technology into her instructional delivery system to meet the needs of her study abroad students. Now therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college by Dr. Kimberly Filos and extend it to her and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. <laughs> Said resolution being adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees, St. Petersburg College, this 21st day of January, January 2020. Dr. Philos. Yeah. We're also going to present you with the traditional carbon spring sponger head wow. on your retirement. <laughs> All right, let's take a picture. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations to each of you, and thank you for all you've done for St. Petersburg College. Um, moving on to our SPC spotlight, we have a number of new um, deans and administrators in our midst, and so um, our first, do you want to make these introductions? Do you want to make them? Yeah, they'll make them. Um, for the um, new dean of humanities and fine arts, who just left the eye. She is <laughs> All right. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan Demers. I'm the Dean of Policy, Ethics, and Legal Studies, and it is my happy pleasure to introduce to you our new Dean of uh, Humanities and Fine Arts. Uh, Barbara Hubbard is well known in our area as a graphic artist, as an educator. She has connections with both Eckerd and USF as a teaching faculty. She's uh, a master teacher. And uh, her, she has, from USF, a PhD in higher ed leadership. And if you listen carefully and maybe watch her attitude, you'll be able to tell that her home country is Jersey. Her <laughs> master's degree and her undergraduate degree are from Mon uh, Montclair State. Dr. Hubbard. Thank you, Dr. Demers, Madam Chairman, President, and all of the trustees. I am very, very happy to be here, and um, I appreciate um, uh, the welcome, and um, I look forward to doing a fabulous job um, in the humanities and fine arts in this wonderful county that embraces the arts. I have uh, wonderful colleagues that I work with, and I think together we will um, just venture out into the community and um, make arts and humanities first in this county. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's my happy pleasure to introduce to you our new Dean of Business. This is Marta Chiborowski. I don't say that name often. Usually she's just Marta. Or Dean P, as they like to call her in her suite. Um, Marta is, uh, let's just say, she's a bundle of energy and unexpected Turns. She's already out in our community. Um, her undergraduate uh, degree is from USF. She has an MBA from Long Island University. See, I said it right, Long Island University. <laughs> and uh, it includes an international component. And that focus on international business as well as state and local uh, has meant that she's already uh, leapt on to numerous projects, including short-term projects that are focused here at the Midtown campus as well as downtown. Ms. Chiborowski, Dean. 
Uh, good morning, Board of Trustees, Dr. Williams. I am very excited about this opportunity. I have been blessed to be at St. Petersburg College since 2009, and um, I've served in a number of different capacities, and I look forward to taking the College biz of Business onto the next phase of growth, um, of uh, development in terms of our programming, and uh, we look forward to ensuring that we serve our community and our students to the best of our capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Dean yeah. Demers, could you come back up? Yes. I want to thank you for hiring both of these people. They're excellent people. I've known both of them for a very long time. I think that the, your involvement and the president's involvement in, in hiring these folks going to take us a long way down the road to where we need to be. So thank you so much. From Keep your our fingers crossed God's there could be some, I'm not, I'm not hoping any ill will on you, either one of you, but you know, I, I've watched both of them work for a very long time and they're both uh, exceptional people and I hope that we can move the colleges, both of them down the road. Uh, in a very nice way. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Gibbons, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Williams? Yes, I have the pleasure of um, introducing Mike Ramsey. Um, we went deep and wide to find Mr. Ramsey and found it right across the bay. <laughs> and so Mike is our new workforce dean, and um, it's, it's a relatively actually new position um, because the workforce role was not dean because it's important for this position to work alongside our academic deans and work collaboratively. Mike comes from um, Hillsborough County Public Schools where he led the technical and adult education um, throughout the entire county um, of Hillsborough. Um, at the secondary level, there's about 70,000 uh, middle and high school students taking CTAE courses and we'd love to have that over here in Pinellas County. Um, he also worked very closely with the technical colleges. He led the technical colleges, Irwin Tech, Leary, Brewster, and I'm going to say it wrong, but Aparicio Levy, um, to provide training for high-skill, high-wage paying jobs. He's very close to career source, economic development leaders. Um, everyone who we've introduced him to so far on this side of the base said, oh, I know him. He's great. And so we're very happy to have his leadership. He's already pushed me a little bit on new programs programs, concepts, and thoughts that we had never thought about. And I'm like, well, Mike, we can try that. Um, and so he's innovative and creative, which is exactly what we needed for this position. He's already helped us look at the budget and funding and bringing on new means of revenue for um, this division. And he's only been here like five weeks. And so, Mike, would you come up and share a few words? Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Trustees, Dr. Williams. I'm super excited to be here. Um, there's workforce going on all throughout St. Petersburg College. Um, just because this position is new does not mean that that concept is new to this school. Um, so what I desire to do is to help to align what we're doing here at St. Pete College internally and then externally to the local workforce to make sure that their needs are being met. Um, workforce development is a simple component. We have a demand from our local <laughs> business and industry, and we're the supply. When those two mesh, it's a beautiful thing because now everybody's employed, their skills are, are being upscaled to the place so they can have a better chance of economic mobility for their families. And that's what we're all about here at St. Petersburg College. I'm happy to be here. Look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Dr. Williams, members of the board. I'm pleased to announce the hiring of Ms. Kimberly Jackson as the new uh, executive director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. Uh, prior to her role, she served as the academic chair for social and behavioral science under the leadership of Joseph, Joseph Smiley. Uh, Ms. Jackson is very involved in Pinellas County, as her, as her bio describes, uh, and she brings forth a wealth of knowledge that we look forward to her uh, bringing new programming to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. With that, please join me in welcoming Ms. Kimberly Jackson.
Good morning, Board of Trustees, and good morning, Dr. Williams. Good morning. Thank you so much. I'm humbled by this opportunity to reinvigorate the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions to revive its mission in alignment with what Congressman Bill Young wanted to achieve with the Institute. We've started with an incredible start with working with the Florida Civic Advance Summit and hosting that program. We have worked with all of the leaders across St. Petersburg College who have graciously agreed to assist with programming, with logos, with website design, with, with reaching out to the community. We're excited to meet with our Board of Trustees and to have our strategic plan to move forward with our vision. Thank you again. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cole, Trustees, Dr. Williams. Good morning. Saved the best for last. Thank you very much. You're going to get in trouble for that one. I am very excited to introduce our new Executive Director of Development, Dr. Luz Randolph. Um, as the Assistant Director of Development at USF, uh, Luz was, was, was responsible for university-wide fundraising efforts for di diversity initiatives at USF. Her primary focus was assisting uh, in cultivating those relationships between USF uh, constituents and the Tampa Bay community. Um, she has successfully raised over three million dollars uh, within that and assisted uh, in the development implementation of the Black Leadership Network, which aims to provide financial and mentoring support to the African American students at USF. We are very excited to have her come and lead our Major Gifts program, build it as we look forward to our 100-year um, comprehensive campaign and all the things that Lewis is going to bring. Um, also want to recognize that Steve Shepard and Mike Carroll are here from the foundation. Um, another illustration that we are trying to integrate and we are doing a very good job at being able to um, all be on the same page and Luz is going to help us uh, get, get there. So, Luz? Good morning. No pressure this morning. I am <laughs> Chair, President Williams, Board of Trustees. I am truly excited to join you all today to continue the mission of SPC, bringing our internal and external community together and getting us to successfully exceed our capital campaign in 2027. Yes. So let's get ready, SPC. I'd like to just like you say, I, I know both of these ladies too, and they're going to do an exceptional job. I just think Dr. Williams is doing a good job in hiring. Um, I don't know about Ms. Randolph, though. She snookered me into a scholarship for USF. And I was like, well, how did you? But anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, I think that one of the things that she did that I really appreciated and liked and um, was that USF has had a problem in USF St. Petersburg, as you well know, of getting minority students mm -hmm. involved. And uh, Ms. Randolph and her team um, came and talked to minorities in St. Petersburg about being focused on helping get scholarships for minorities from St. Petersburg to attend USF St. Pete. Well, in that regard, where are they coming from? They're coming from St. Pete College, right? And so um, I really like that concept. So thank you for doing that. I'm glad you're aboard, as well as Ms. Jackson, who I've known for, I don't know, it's too far, too long to tell. But I think both of these women are going to be exceptional at, um, to your team at the college. So thank you for looking, being, uh, having the foresight of hiring them and moving forward with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can move on to our comments. And I just have a couple. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Trustee Kidwell and Trustee Stonecipher, who had to be out of town this week, um, for attending the AFC uh, meetings in Tallahassee. And Trustee Gibbons um, joined us uh, for a, a, one of those meetings as well. Uh, we had a very productive trip in Tallahassee, meeting with each one of our legislators who were sponsors of initiatives uh, for the college, specifically um, two funding requests. And we also talked about the state college system generally and the significant need to increase the amount of base funding. As each of you know, over the past three years, almost three years, um, 
Dr. Williams and her team has cut over $14 million from the college budget, and that has taken a significant toll on everyone, and we certainly understand that and appreciate that and appreciate each of you sitting here. As Trustee Giddens said, the um, five hires we, we see this morning is an example of uh, the reset that has been happening here over the past three years, and, and we, we certainly um, recognize that. And I think the legislature does as well, um, at least hopefully the uh, incoming, <laughs> incoming leadership of the legislature. Um, so Eric Eddy, thank you so much for all of your hard work in coordinating our trip. And we had a really good um, three days there last week. So thanks um, to each of you. So others? Sorry, I couldn't be there. Yes, we missed you. <coughs> you know. And we'll be in, Tal in DC in a couple weeks, in yeah. a few weeks, doing the same thing. At, in DC, so. Madam Chair, I, yes, I, I'd like to say I thought it was a very good time. Even though I attended one meeting, I, um, Dr. Williams gave me probably five assignments. <laughs> um, um, and I think that we made some significant headway in terms of making sure that our appropriations requests are taken seriously um, in this legislative session. Um, uh, meeting with um, the Incoming Senate, uh, President um, Wilton Simpson, I think you've got a good feel and flavor of what is going to happen going forward. He's looking out for the region. He wants us to be successful. In fact, praise this board for the type of work that it does compared to other boards. Um, so, <clears throat> and, and, um, and having those meetings, um, and we, we have to make sure that we do one of two things. One is we have to be very responsive when they need answers to questions. And number two, make sure we're in their face the entire year, not yes. just during the legislative session. We have to work them during the summertime to make sure that we educate them on what we're looking to do in the summertime so that the fall and the spring are merely just steps we have to go through to make sure that we get funded. Um, it is not always based upon how much money you give. Well, that is a great thing to be able to do, but I don't think anybody up here is writing, you know, $100,000 checks. So <clears throat> uh, I think you know, what we have to do is spend more time with legislators as we did last week mm -hmm. and make sure that they are very well educated on what we are trying to accomplish and how it impacts students, not just in Pinellas County, but how it can be utilized statewide as a, as a pilot programs and other things. So I think we had a, a good week. Um, I think you guys did an excellent job. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing what happens in Washington. By the way, um, Dr. Williams this morning, I met with, uh, last night I met with U.S. Senator Marco Rubio. He assures me that he will meet with you himself as long as it's 7 a.m. or so because they have a trial going on. <laughs> um, but he said that, I, I told him that you have not been able to get a time with him. He assured me he would do that and I'll give you the contact to be able to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I think it also, um, if I can add on to that, one thing that it may not always be clear to the broader college community is um, the Board of Trustees is obviously doing the work that we think is the best for our local community. And that's our job, is making sure that our community is served by St. Petersburg College. But we have the reality that um, we are directly tied to the state college system and the legislative appropriations uh, system as well. And so being responsive and reactive and not only reactive but proactive, and those were, that was some of the things that we heard from our legislators in the future. Um, there, I know that some of the changes made over the past couple years have been hard to swallow, um, and they've been significant here locally, um, but really it was affirming to me to hear that we are going in the best direction in doing what we need to do, mm -hmm. not only to be a leader in our community for economic mobility and for service and education, but really among the state. And so um, I compliments to Dr. Williams and all of you all, because it's not always easy to make those changes, especially as significant of changes as have been made over the past couple of years. So. Madam Chair, I really wanted to ask uh, President Simpson, did he, does he watch our board meeting? Because I, I was like, I don't think we do that good of a job. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he was extremely complimentary. He was very yeah. complimentary. Yes. Yeah. He was. It was nice. So, anyone else have any words? 
I was just going to uh, hopefully not steal your thunder because it's been all over Facebook and everything else, but congratulate you on the U.S. News and, and World Report um, top 100 colleges yes. in the nation. And, uh, something to be extremely proud yes. of and as a uh, trustee and vice chair. And yes. I, it's, yeah. So Thank again, you. I apologize for not being able to go to Tallahassee with you, but I went to Tallahassee and D.C. last year, so. <laughs> We missed you, you last week, but no. Oh oh but no, we'll have you again soon. Okay. <laughs> um, Trustee Kidwell, anything to add? For someone that <laughs> had never been on a trip like that or roamed the halls of Tallahassee, it was very eye-opening, and I, uh, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we had fun, but it was extremely professional, and uh, I learned a lot from Dr. Williams and, and the other trustees, and it was... Uh, I plan on going every year, so uh, as long as they'll have me. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. President Williams. Well, we have been um, very busy, and, and I, too, want to chime in on the Tallahassee trip. Eric, you did an amazing, fantastic job. And Eric's role is herding cats. Um, <laughs> we have all types of ideas and approaches that we want to take with each legislator. And she helps us know, OK, this one, go this way. No, Tanja, don't do that. So thank you for that. And it was very, very profitable. I think I shared this with the team. We received very good feedback. We did spend time with our local delegates during the summer this year. We did go visit. We invited them. Some spoke at graduation. And we're moving and we're bringing them into our family um, so that they know who we are. Yesterday, we had 37 MLK Day of Service projects going on in this county all at one time. And I'm very proud of that because at first, we only did it in the city of St. Pete. Now we've expanded it to the whole Pinellas County. And we had 37 projects of service to follow Dr. King's vision. Um, as well as our core, um, you know, beliefs that we're here to be a part of the community and to engage our community, and we did just that. We were also a part of the St. Pete Parade, which is one of the largest um, parades, um, I would say, regionally at least. And it was well um, attended with several bands, and SBC had their float there, and we have our music and going right down the street uh, with everyone else, so I thought that was good. Um, I want to thank um, Trustee Cole um, and uh, Steve Shepard, Mr. Warsaw for being there for us at the hub that we celebration we had for the incubator at Tarpon, Dr. Um, Davis. Um, and we had um, coverage, news coverage. Can you believe that? ABC Action News and Bay News 9 was there. They did an amazing coverage and we were on TV for a long time and a lot of um, reiterations it's really a big deal that this hub goes off with no problem because it is going to impact how we work with business and industry and it's going to impact the quality of our students when they go to work they're going to have that hands-on experience and that training and we'll improve our relationship with our workforce leaders so i'm real proud about that um, Trustee Bello already talked about the online rankings that um, SPC was um, named top tier of Florida schools listed by the U.S. News and World Report, 2020 best online programs, um, especially for veterans and online ba bachelor programs. And so I'm real proud of that. Um, in the southern region, we rank 16th best for online programs and 21st best for bachelor programs in U.S. World News. And nationally, uh, we were listed 39th um, in uh, the first category and 58th in the second. So before, we weren't listed at all. And so now we're on the list. Mm -hmm. So I like to tell those other colleges, be ready, we're coming. <laughs> Um, also, another ranking, we rank seventh in the nation for short-term study abroad programs for associate degree colleges. Um, and we rank third in Florida and 11th in the nation for associate colleges sending students abroad um, in programs. And this was uh, made possible by a lot of work through the foundation, um, through scholarships and opportunities to help offset the cost for students to have an experience of a lifetime. Um, many have hardly ever stepped outside of Florida. Um, let alone the country. And so thank you to the foundation for your help and your support of our students studying um, abroad. 
And then on the first week back to school, the Barrett family gave St. Petersburg College $50,000 for workforce to help our veterans. And you just couldn't come back to a better president uh, uh, than that. And they really want us to get started right now. <laughs> Share that money right now. So we have no problem doing that. And so we'll be celebrating the Barrett family and what they have done to further help our veterans um, to help them move forward. And I just want to thank my team for the work that we've done for opening um, session. You guys will hear the data on where we are. While we still have a lot of work to do, the deans are moving on new programs and the new schedule. We'll be um, sharing that with you guys for the fall. Um, we're meeting every Friday to get this right and to make sure that it actually occurs. So we're done looking and researching. It's time to do the work. So I just want to thank you for the work that you have done. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't have any blue cards for public comments, but is there any is there anyone from the public who would like to speak? All right, moving on. Um, we have review and approval of minutes. Has has the board had an opportunity? So there are moved. three specific meetings. Okay. Any changes or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, monthly reports. Ms. Gardner. Good morning, Chair Cole and trustees. I don't, do not have a report this month. Thank you. Um, and next, uh, going back to our new format, we are excited uh, to invite Dr. Wilkins to the podium and uh, to speak about the Leaper Ratner Museum of Art. Good morning, Chair Cole, trustees, uh, Madam President. I'm very excited to be here this morning and share a little bit about the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art, which is situated on our Tarpon Springs campus. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with me, uh, I am uh, Teresa Wilkins. I'm the new director of the museum. I say new because it's been less than a year. Um, but it's been a very productive um, past about nine months now. And I'm excited to share a lot of the uh, improvements that we're making and the progress that we're making towards our goals. So the number one question I'm asked about the museum is, what does the museum actually do? And we sum that up with our mission statement which is to collect, conserve, exhibit, and protect the works of art that have been entrusted to our care and our stewardship at the museum. And we do that through our exhibitions, programs, and our ever-expanding collection of 20th and 21st century arts. We strive to engage, inspire, and stimulate our diverse community by providing all sorts of opportunities for education, enlightenment, interpretation of arts, and research to students, scholars, and the general public. A little history on the museum. We first opened our doors in 2002. Um, actually, tomorrow is our birthday, so we're very excited. Um, the museum was established um, through a cooperative uh, agreement between Dr. Alan Lipa, St. Petersburg College Foundation, the college itself, and the state of Florida. Notable artists include, of course, Abraham Ratner and Alan Lipa, uh, who we are named after, Esther Gentle, um, and probably some more familiar names, uh, Picasso, Chagall, Leger, Henry Moore, and Miro, just to name a few. In 2010, our collections expanded through the acquisition of the former Gulf Coast Museum of Arts collection. That added about 4,000 works of art to our collection and uh, sort of added an additional focus of our collecting, which is that of contemporary Florida artists. So art made after 1990, because now that's contemporary. <laughs> In 2013, um, we were uh, able to achieve our accreditation from the American Alliance of Museums, which we are very proud of. That's a distinction that's held by fewer than 6% of all US museums. And we are in the process of getting ready for our reaccreditation, which occurs next year. Today, we are proud to serve all of Tampa Bay with visitors from Pasco, Hernando, Hillsborough, Manatee, Pinellas, and across the world. One of the things that I'm most proud of about the museum is our robust community uh, partnerships. 
I'm not going to read this giant list to you, um, which is really just a selection of the most re recent partnerships we have. Um, but I'm very proud to, to point out that we have over a dozen different educational and uh, cultural institutions on this list that we have active partnerships with throughout our community. One of the things that I think is important to always stress, especially to our legislators, is the impact that the arts have, not just on folks who are interested in fine arts, but on our society as a whole. So uh, again, I'm not gonna read you this giant list, but this is a snapshot of all of the different ways that the arts can impact our social environment. And these specifically are ways that we at the museum are interacting with our community to do so from our art therapy program, which serves veterans throughout the Tampa Bay region, um, to all of our different sort of educational uh, panel discussions, which bring up issues about women's rights, including the 19th Amendment ratification, which we're celebrating through two new exhibitions opening this Friday shameless plug, um, to all of our different work within the school um, and integrating better into the curriculum to provide history, tradition, and cultural studies to, to the public. In addition to our social impact, we have a very large economic impact within the Tarpon Springs community. And it's one that I'm very proud of. Um, through our total expenditures of over 800,000, um, which is significant for the Tarpon area, and our creation of over 24 full-time jobs with that, um, we are proud to say that the total economic impact of our museum in, last, in 2019 was $2,317,854. Uh, $2, um, and that is uh, reflective of the above. If we look at the museum by the numbers, just last year we had over 10,000 visitors to the museum. And I'd like to take a moment and thank Trustee Kidwell, and although he's not here this morning, Trustee Stonecipher, um, they came and visited the museum this fall and asked a lot of really great questions about what we're doing and how they can be of help and service. And Trustee Kidwell, we are excited to have you on our board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, of those visitors, we had over 500 students um, come through school tours in the community that we provide free of charge. Um, and we had over 1,000 SPC students. And for the first time ever, we have expanded our offerings of free memberships to all SPC students, faculty, and staff. Um, we have seen an increase in our membership, therefore, and we have over 312 active members at the museum, more than ever before. We've put on more than 150 programs and events in the 2019 calendar year. Despite all of this, however, we are currently operating at a loss. We are expecting a loss of around $54,000 for the current fiscal year. I'm not gonna stand here and uh, make excuses for why that's happened. Um, I'm sure you've all heard it before at our board meetings. Um, I'm going to tell you our solutions to these problems that we're facing. Through a, a um, large comprehensive sort of strategy that we're unveiling, um, one of the things that we're doing to increase our revenue is by reevaluating and streamlining the price structures and benefits of our membership. Um, in addition to that, we've really sort of taken a, a deep dive into what have our outreach strategies been for membership and increasing that throughout the year. Through some of the new strategies we've employed over the last eight months, we've seen a 25% increase in our membership revenue. So we're very excited about the progress we're making on that. In addition to that, we're looking at greater integration with uh, the SPC Foundation and the college in terms of grant writing. Um, we're working ahead on all of that for the next few years. And we're very excited to be welcoming a new development officer to the museum, Angela Minescola. She starts on the 27th, so in just a little less than a week now. Um, she has over a decade of working in museums and development experience, so we are uh, comforted with the fact that she's gonna be able to hit the ground running. In addition to all of that, we've been looking at how we can diversify our store inventory and lower the average price point to make it more accessible not only to students, but also to the general public. And through those initiatives, our sales are up 12% over last fiscal year. Through all of the new programs that we've been rolling out, some of those over 150, um, and our new community and college partnerships, our attendance is up nearly 4% this fiscal year. 
and we're excited to see what happens with our new partnership with Eckerd's uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, or the uh, Ali program, so to speak, as we will be their sort of seat for their North County programs. Looking at the museum for this year and beyond, uh, we are excited to be partnering with all different areas of uh, the campus to celebrate Tarpon's 50th anniversary this year. Um, as I mentioned, we will be going through our reaccreditation process next year. And in 2022, we are poised to celebrate our 20th anniversary. So we have some really big plans for that, so please stay tuned. Um, part of that is our three-year calendar of exhibitions and programs. For the first time in the museum's history, we have a strategically developed three-year plan of exhibitions and programs that not only look at what's going on in our campus, but what's going on college-wide and community-wide, so that we are always relevant and we are always tuned in to the needs of our community and students. Um, and we have an upcoming board retreat on February 22nd, which will help us lay out our new strategic plan to take us into the next five years, focusing strongly on diversifying our board members, diversifying our programs, um, and making sure that we are fully integrated into the college. And that is what I have for you today. Wonderful, thank you so much. Any questions? Are there any questions? All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Hey, good morning, Chair Cole, members of the board, and Dr. Williams. Uh, I wanted to start off today by uh, thanking Dr. Williams and the college leadership for supporting our submission to the New York, New, uh, U.S. News and World Report. You probably don't realize this is our first time we've submitted over in my tenure of seven years, and I think that um, the teams that put that information together, my IR team, the Enrollment Services, Financial Aid, they did an amazing job of pulling that all together, and I think it really shows where we're at um, in regards to the rest of the state and the rest of the nation, so thank you very much for that. So I'm here today to do two things. I'm going to start off with our monthly dashboard, and you can see it's a new format. You no longer have your placemat, but what we are rolling out is an online uh, strategic uh, monthly dashboard, which you can actually put on your phones. It's mobile friendly. We're going to send you the link, and you can pull it up if you happen to be sitting and you want to share some really good news with someone. You can just pull that right up. So I'm going to be starting today with um, our uh, recruitment information. And this is going to show you through the entire fall, all the way through the end of December. So it's the, the month of December, but also it encom encompasses the entire fall. So beginning with, oh, beginning with our applications, this is really tricky. <coughs> you can see that our applications, we were down by 1.9% in the fall alone. And you'll hear more about that when we, uh, Dr. Renard comes up. And that also translates into our new students enrolled, which was down in the fall for negative 0.7%. The good news is that Dr. Renard and his team have just rolled out a new recruitment plan that's just recently been improved. Um, it includes restructuring for our, our recruitment specialists with some new metrics that they're going to be focusing on, new job descriptions, and uh, a plan to fill those vacant seats. So we should hopefully see this increase, we're hoping, um, in the near future. In regards to our Workforce Institute, which if you remember from last year was the one that was struggling, you can see that they've had great success in increasing their numbers of students, and they're actually up 4.6% this fall. If I move over to our retention area, our event attendance, which you know is connected to student success, we had a goal this fall of reaching 14,000 students attending events, and we've exceeded that by 164 students. We're very proud of that, that and well on our way to increase our, get to our target of 30,000 at the end. Our learning resource usage, uh, we are up 12%, so our learning resource team had a very specific goal of reaching out to our African American males. I think if you remember, we were talking about that. And this fall alone, we had we reached out to all of those uh, African American males who had a GPA below 2.49 or equal to 2.49. There are about 371 of those students. 58% of those students came in for tutoring. 19% actually increased their GPA above a 2.49, so that's huge. And 50% of the students showed some movement of their GPA in the upward trend, so that's a huge initiative and we're really proud of that work. 
Our overall withdrawal rate, we try to have a stretch goal of trying to reach negative 5% because we were in double digits the prior fall. We were at negative 2%. We're proud of that number. We think that that was a really good place to end. So students were withdrawing from their courses at a lower rate this fall. If I move over into employee engagement, this is the same survey results that you've been seeing. Just wanted to give you an update that the next survey is going to be going out in March, so you'll be seeing some information about that then. If I look at our learning experience, so the first one has to do with Spark usage. If you remember, that's when faculty members are able to go through our learning management system and actually send text messaging to our students, also connected to student success through the numbers. We have an increase this fall of 47%. That's huge for us. Even more important is that the, the faculty email tools usage, which you know kind of lags because faculty like to use the, either the student's personal email or their SBC email. This is just within the learning management system. In December alone, we had a 373% increase of faculty reaching out specifically about re-enrollment. So you can see that we're up 3.3 overall in the fall, and I think that that shows how dedicated our faculty are to reaching out to our students along with the rest of our staff. And of course, our, fa our faculty, uh, our participation in professional development, you can see we're up 28%. Again, as you noted, we're working on trying to get no true headcount numbers. This is individuals attending events overall. And then finally, for resource alignment, our grants team is knocking it out of the ballpark. They're at $8.8 .8 million through December right now. Our Titan Fund, another amazing piece. You can see that we're up 68.4%. We've hit $79,000 thanks to the recent campaign. And our revenue, which is focused on our non-state, that last number of 51,000, 51 million where we're at right now, we're actually trending about 640,000 below our budget. This was a request that you made the last time to kind of give us a sense of where are we in the budget with this. And that's mainly due to our, um, our, our, lack, our, our lower tuition, our lower student enrollment numbers, which Dr. Renari will talk about in a few minutes. That is our monthly dashboard. Are there any questions I can answer about that? I, I wanted to say thank you. I, as we've said, this has been a work in progress, but I appreciate um, the metrics that you've chosen and then reminding us why we've chosen that metric, you know, event attendance means the students are engaged, which means they'll re-enroll, and I, I think that are good reminders for all of us so we're not just focused on, um, you know, specifically how many emails are being sent, that, that's not the right. point, but, you know, the much higher level goal, so exactly. um, thank you. I know we all want to look at those revenue numbers, so we'll, yes. we'll wait till we get to that portion. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you're anything? still up. I am still up. <laughs> okay, so now I'm here to talk a little bit about our fall and our winter 2019 course success rates. I just shared about the course with withdrawals and our goal and that we're down negative uh, 2%, but that's actually a positive. <coughs> I'm going to look at retention rates. So we do have a strategic plan goal of increasing our retention rate by 3.2%. You can see that we're probably, we're pretty much like at a steady right now, fall over fall. Um, our Hispanics are showing our largest increases, and the African Americans, our students right now, are the ones that are most challenged with being retained. Um, we're, we're going to be working very hard, and if you can remember that we brought forward um, a plan, and you'll see uh, more effects of that plan, both positive and the need for additional um, in just a few seconds. So just to kind of um, share, uh, from now on, I'm, I'm going to be using African Americans when I talk about African American and black students, and I'm going to be using Hispanics for Hispanic Latinos, but it's encompassing of all of those groups. So our overall course success rates, and this has always been our move the needle, just kind of nudge it forward, nudge it forward, nudge it forward. You can see that in the uh, red line on, over to the right, we are still nudging forward. We're about 0.3% up from last fall. That's a good sign. That means our students are being more successful in the classroom. And we also track that overall for the year, and that also is showing small increases year over year. Now we're going to look at our overall students. How are they doing? This is that big, messy slide, so I'm going to color code it for you and walk it through. So 
for all students, when we look at our male students and our African American students, you're going to see that they have an increase this year. That's a good sign. We haven't seen that in a long time. And if you follow the second yellow line all the way across over to the gap analysis, our African American students, though woefully disparate from our overall success rates, are closing the achievement gap just a little bit. And that's a, that's a really good sign for us. Unfortunately, if we go down to the bottom two lines, our African-American males and our uh, Hispanic males are the ones that are still slightly below and their gaps are continuing to increase. But this is the entire student body. So we are doing many things like the learning resource initiative, but I'm going to show you where that really kicks in and that has to do with our first time in college students. So if you think about our first time in college students, these are the ones that we're most likely to lose. These are the ones that we're most likely to be concerned about. And so when you look again, this time it's completely opposite. Both our males and our African American students are showing declines. But our males, where a lot of our initiatives are focused on, are increasing. And those gaps are getting smaller, just a little, but every little bit counts right now. So that African American male initiative that the Learning Resource Center had, as well as our new um, advisor dashboard, which is an FTIC cohort, that advisors track those students and communicate those students over the course of multiple semesters to make sure that they're kind of in line, they're re-enrolling, they know what they need. It's having an effect on this population, which is a really good news. Uh, I've stopped sharing the developmental education success rates as a big slide. It's over in the little blue box over on the right. You can see that we're continuing to increase. We're up 1.2%, all the way up to 67.1% overall. But our student numbers in that group dropped another 155 students. We're now down below 1,000 students who are enrolling in developmental education courses. So it's less important than it is for us to talk about those who are choosing to go into gateway courses, which you can see in the bigger um, spread. Again, you can look at our males and our African Americans. They are the ones that are showing um, the largest concern for us, as well as our African American males. This is no, con this is no surprise to us. This is where our challenge has been. This is where all of our focus is. And again, it expresses the need for us to have a larger program with something like we brought forward earlier. The good news is if you look at our um, Hispanic males, they are showing a, a, a very decreased gap at this point, and so we're very happy with those numbers. Finally, when we look at our winter courses, so this was our second winter of offering courses. Last year was just a pilot, so we gave you an overall winter course success rate of 75.5%. You can see we increased it to 78.3%, plus additional courses, additional sections, additional students. I took the time to break it down because I think it's really important to kind of look at how are we doing. In regards to our males, they did very, very well at 81.1%. Our African American students, on the other hand, they actually um, decreased in regards to our fall numbers. They were actually down um, a slight bit, about 2.4% based upon their numbers for the fall. But if you look at our African American male students, those that we would have thought that in a short four-week class might have struggled the most, they actually increased 8.4% in their success rates, showing that this is something that we need to look at very carefully. Are these shorter courses really more effective for maybe some of the student body? Small amount of students, but it's something to glean for us to be thinking about how do we make shorter classes um, more effective for, the, for some of our student populations. These are the noteworthy observations. They're more here for the record. I've just kind of walked through all of them. I don't think I'm going to need to repeat them. Um, I did want to share with you, however, that we have several next steps. Our strategic priorities that came out of our December board meeting um, are written out here for you. So as we bring forward those initiatives, you know that they're going to be connected in one of these five areas or one of these five priorities that you identified as being the most important. Do you have any questions for me? Anyone? One thing that we talked a lot about last week, both with the state college system and then several legislators brought up, was dual enrollment classes and the potential expansion of those. And interestingly, we had a very specific conversation um, about whether it was appropriate for the developmental ed classes to be offered as dual enrollment as a way to preload. Preload, you know, it, it, because I think. Trustee Gibbons so um, reminds us regularly the burden that some of those dev ed classes um, place on the college 
across everything, our mm -hmm. metrics, our funding, our everything. everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was a, a really creative option was mm -hmm. to, if we can start with some of these kids in dual enrollment for dev ed and move forward. But. You know, Madam Chair, it also allows us, for, and it's just as bad to do, but we almost in a situation that we have to do it, it allows us to cherry pick the best and the brightest first, <laughs> right. right? And there are probably some of those young people that, and I know some of them, I ask their parents all the time, why are you sending this kid to TCC? Why are you sending this kid to Miami Dade? It doesn't make any sense. Right? You can do the same thing here. Um, so um, it would allow us to contact them earlier, get in the pipeline in terms of getting them into school. And it's easier, I think. I think a lot of they don't, they don't really, a lot of these parents or students don't really understand that they can still transfer somewhere else. But they think, oh, well, I have college credit at St. B College. I better just continue that track and finish, right? So it allows us to get the better students, um, the ones that are pretty much prepared for college. Um, which helps offset some of the other stuff that we have to deal with in terms of funding. Mm -hmm. I think um, the work that the team is doing, I think it's Dr. Smiley, I could be wrong, we're actually piloting a dual enrollment class um, for students who don't have a 3.0 to um, help them gain some college credit and experiences so that um, we're doing it, I think, at just one, I don't know if Dr. Smiley's here, I think it's just one school. One school, SLS 1101. Right, and so we're, we're actually trying to work with all students, but you know, in, in all honesty, a lot of our struggle is actually the adult learner. Um, we, you know, at SPC, we have an older population um, of students, and you'll see that number declining when Dr. Renard comes in. Um, that they finished high school 20 years ago. And, and so th that's the code we've got to crack. I think that is the group that we need to spend more time with, maybe starting with a workforce-based program that they can get a skill um, to get a higher wage paying job, and then look at the gen ed and, and other courses. And so that is the area that I think the college is also going to need to focus on Madam, for our older adults. I'm president. Um, you know, it's interesting you say that. I also sit, um, as you know, on the Bethune-Cookman University right. Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that we're struggling with is something similar. There's an older learner, but also those learners, their average GPA of entrance is around 2.5 or 2.3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we've done and we've seen quite a bit of success with under the leadership of Judge Perry as our chair um, is we've gone to a summer bridge con concept that if you're coming back to school, that you have to attend the summer bridge program, and or if you're coming in just below our acceptance GPA, if we accept you, um, you have to come to that summer bridge program, um, which allows for that student to be immersed in college, but also allows for them to um, get extra help on those things that they before they, before they get started. Mm -hmm. And it is purely, they can accept it, you know, we don't, you, you turn it down, that's fine, you just can't come. Um, that may be an alternative for us to start looking at a program like that. I know that law schools are doing that too um, because it's just so hard to get ramped up so quickly, um, especially when you've not been in school for a very long time. Oh, you've never with, been. With all of the other things that, that, you know, a lot of the, I can tell you that at BCU, a lot of those uh, are, uh, single mothers who are coming back to school who are used to juggling a lot of things. So having a lot of things on their plate is not an issue. It is just a matter of getting back focused in on um, school as a priority. So it's a good idea. I mean, we do have summer bridge, but it's again for the recent high school graduate. It's not for the returning or a new student who's this is my first time and I'm 40 or what have you. So that's something we could definitely look at. Yeah, it's just always the constant balance that the expectation and, and need for yeah. us to be yeah. everything to, to everyone. everyone. Yeah. I mean, we have an open door policy. We're taking all of these students, no matter what their level of preparation is, and wherever we can chip away at the success rates. Well, so, Madam yeah. Chair and, and, and Trustee Kidd, well, you heard it best last week. You know, mm -hmm. Senator President was talking about I don't have any more money for the universities because you know they only do specific things, and we got to try to figure it all out. Workforce. 
how to get them through their AA. Then get them to the master's program if the program doesn't exist at USF. And then get if they the want to get back and get a job and get retrained or retooled. We gotta, I mean, so you think about it, we are kind of jack of all trades without all the funding. Mm -hmm. Right? The, only, the universities only do, the universities only want to do Smart. one thing. They want to get money for research. They want to be research and they want to produce all oh, the best and the brightest. But, you know, they don't want to give up anything. They don't want to do anything, that's for sure. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Carr. <laughs> Great job, by the way. Good job. <clears throat> Dr. Bernard. Good morning, Madam Chair, Madam President, members of the board. My name is Pat Renard, Associate VP for Enrollment Services. As you know, the spring semester got underway last week, and I'm going to brief you on our enrollment. <coughs> Before I do, I want to talk about where we landed for fall. So the first chart at the top shows budgeted student semester hours compared to where we actually landed at the end of the fall term. So we're slightly above what we had budgeted for in, in terms of our student semester hours. Um, the bottom chart, if you would look at the first column, the beginning of the term, when I stood up here in August, I reported that we had a, a minus 1.6 uh, compared to the previous uh, beginning of term. We did narrow that gap. At the end of the term, we were down minus 1, so we closed that gap a little bit by growing our enrollment throughout the fall term. As Dr. Crawford mentioned, we did have our winter session, which is actually part of the spring enrollment, which is why I'm in including it. Um, this is the second year that we've had the winter session. It was very successful. Just to uh, recap, it's a four-week uh, session that began on December 16th and ended on January 10th. Uh, very intensive. Uh, I just want to thank our faculty. We had 22 faculty members that um, gave up part of their uh, winter break to teach these students. You can see the number of classes grew from 12 last year to 30. Uh, number of students from 368 to 680. And the student semester hours grew from 1104 to 1938. So pretty significant increases there. And then the, uh, as Dr. Crawford uh, mentioned, our success rate was 78.3% for those uh, classes uh, compared to 75.5. So very proud of that. So here's where we uh, stand as of last week. Um, our head count, we're down. 3.2%. Uh, we have uh, about 100, I'm sorry, 850 fewer students enrolled this spring right now. May I interrupt you? Yes. I'm sorry. Does that include the winter session? It does. Okay. It so does. with the increase of the winter session, if we took that out, it would be even, even a greater. That's yeah. correct. Less. Okay. And minus 3.5 in terms of student semester hours. If we disaggregate that student semester hour um, off to the right, you see lower division is minus 3.4 and our baccalaureate uh, contribution is minus 4.3. Um, we do have a plan to address the uh, upper division. The deans are um, working on a plan with marketing, enrollment service, and other, uh, other uh, departments to shore up the gap with our uh, upper division enrollment. As you know, college uh, nationwide college declines is an issue, has been an issue, and obviously, obviously this is not where we want to uh, uh, find ourselves. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some strategies and some steps that we have to um, decrease this enrollment gap throughout the spring term. This is a trend line. So we had a 12-week registration cycle for spring. Uh, at one point, we had a deficit of 11%. Uh, so uh, our students were uh, pro uh, procrastinating. Uh, we, we narrowed that gap. Um, just uh, before the uh, new year, we were uh, almost uh, minus 2%. Uh, it grew back up to minus 3.5%. Last year, between New Year's and when classes began, we registered 400 uh, more students than we did this year. So um, students are procrastinating. We are working with marketing to try to uh, bust some myths about waiting for grades to be posted before you register and things like that. This looks at headcount by academic program. So our certificate programs, which are our short-term 18 credits, 24 credit programs, is up 7.2%. Uh, um, leading the way in those areas are internet security, certificates, um, medical coding, computer programming. Uh, associate in science is down 9.5%, but 
Uh, there's a caveat there. We actually uh, moved 600 students from that AS degree in the Health Services Administration to uh, AA. So that decline is not as, as big as it looks like. Uh, there are still some AS programs that are in decline, uh, vet tech, uh, public safety, uh, criminal justice, uh, to name a, a couple. Uh, AA is about flat. I think that's where we probably have um, more work to do in terms of retention because we did shift some students to that, that degree program. Uh, baccalaureate students are down 115 students or 2.6% and our non-degree seeking students which are students that are dual, uh, students that are transient students from other college, uh, students that are just seeking um, uh, to take a course for enrichment purposes were flat. If we look at uh, enrollment uh, by what we call enrollment type, our continuing students, which are students that have been enrolled in at least one semester in the last year, we're minus 2.4%. Uh, that's 547 students. Our new students, which are brand new to SPC, that's our FTIC students, plus our transfer students, we're down 6.1%. Uh, the number there is 100, I'm sorry, is uh, 131. And our readmitted students, that's a student who has been out uh, for a year or more and they're coming back, we're down 9.2%. And uh, that's 173 students, uh, fewer than last year. If we look at headcount by ethnicity, African American students, we're down 4.9%, 175 fewer African American students. Uh, Asian students, um, up 4%. Hispanic students are up 1.3%, which is, as you know, a trend we've seen for the last five years. Our white students were down 4.6%. Uh, that translates to 733 white students. If we look at gender, uh, females are down 2.5%. Uh, males are down 4.5%. Uh, proportionately, uh, males dropped about a half a percent uh, overall. And then by age, as Dr. Williams alluded, um, 21 and under, a uh, slight increase, 0.4%. Uh, but in the 22 and above, in every category, we're down uh, pretty significantly, 5.7%, 4.3%, 6%, .7%, uh, 4 6 about 300 students in each of those categories. And lastly, if we look at enrollment status, uh, full-time uh, is minus 3.5% and part-time minus 3.1%. And you see the proportion there, it's about 68% part-time, which hasn't moved uh, much from last year. I won't take the time to go through uh, these. It's a recap. We'll f spend a few minutes talking about what we intend to do uh, to reduce this gap over the spring term. First and foremost, um, we still have uh, opportunities to grow enrollment with our express uh, session, which begins on February 10th, and our eight-week two session, which begins on March 16th. So um, if it's not already on our main webpage, uh, it will be today that we'll be promoting uh, those two sessions uh, and enrollment in those two sessions. You should have a rack card in front of you, uh, this new 12 and 12 campaign. Um, thanks to Dr. Griffith and her team. This is an opportunity that they're piloting here at the Midtown campus where a student can earn 12 credits in 12 weeks in the, that express session. And Dr. Crawford uh, alluded a few minutes ago to uh, some populations of students are, are doing well in a shorter condensed session site. So that, uh, excited to see how we do here. Um, contacting students who are within 12 credits. You may remember there was some legislation last year that got passed uh, called the Last Mile Program. Uh, we've identified those students. Mike Bennett and his team have identified a pot of money uh, to help those students. So we are reaching out to those students to encourage them to apply for um, uh, that money. And if, if money is an obstacle to get them across the finish line, uh, there may be money for them. Um, we continually reach out to students that we contact or, or, or refer to as stopouts. So students that have been here in the past that for some reason they're in good standing and, and they're um, not enrolled with us. We are partnering with CareerSource Pinellas um, to do a campaign that CareerSource Pinellas has got 
uh, quite a substantial pot of money uh, for students uh, 18 to 24 year old, there's certain criteria that they have to meet uh, for stop out students. Um, so we are uh, contacting 1,000 students beginning today to encourage those students to come back and they can choose to come back into either a credit program or a workforce institute program uh, in the area of computer science, uh, business, uh, health science, and engineering. So we're, we're excited about that pilot um, and what that might yield. But that's a small segment. We continually reach out to the, the larger population of students who have stopped out. And then there's a, a population of students that apply, and when they apply, they say they're going to start uh, in the spring term or they're going to start in the fall term. And so we go after these students that said they were going to start in the spring, but they never enrolled. So there's a, there's a communication plan and campaign that we follow, but we will be even more aggressive to try and encourage them to come back, if not in the spring, summer or fall. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have for me. One of the things that I appreciate, Bernard, that you did not mention is um, Reggie Reed is work with you to restructure all of recruitment that has been approved and we're moving forward with that. But one of the things that I've learned over time is it's never good to go back and contact people who have already left. You know, they're, they're gone. Um, and so we're spending time with them to get them to come back. Career Source has some resources to help pay and offset the cost. So that will be very helpful. Um, but I also think that the structure that you guys have developed with Reggie Reed is going to pay off. Um, and as we move that forward, it won't help for spring, but it'll help for fall. And so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. I look forward to that. Is there, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Um, is there any, um, I know we're past the drop ad period, right? So for, it's, 16. for the 16 for the weeks. 16, the uh, so, so we have some, um, we can make up some of that ground mm -hmm. during the express courses, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how, what are your projections on that? Do you have any, or I don't want to. Yeah, as you, as I shared in the fall, we, we closed that gap from minus 1.6 and we ended at minus one. Okay. Um, I think with a full court press and everybody's um, attention and effort on this, we could close that from a minus uh, 3.5 to a minus two. If we're very aggressive. Okay. I almost hate to ask this question. <laughs> um, because of all of our good efforts with our One College Initiative. Mm -hmm. But do we see a greater um, decline on any particular campus, or is it just somewhat across the board, or any particular programs? I mean, I know degrees, we, you just, mm -hmm. we are looking at those, but. It really is across the board. Okay. Um, the only campus that, that uh, is up is Tarpon, and if you recall, we had the collegiate high school cohort, um, and that's contributing to their that's being slightly up. I'm sure one more question. Yes. I'm sorry, Dr. Nard, um, yes. this is an excellent report. I just got one question. You talked about it's career source, right? And they have some monies to help us. Are we connecting them with our new person in the workforce development to make sure that we're utilizing that money and going after some people that may be looking at our programs as well. Can we utilize some of that dollars? For Absolutely. Them? Okay, yes. I just want to make sure. I know they can be sometimes pretty hard to deal with, so I just want to make sure. Mike's got the secret sauce. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. And all right. along those lines, at the opening of the incubator two weeks ago, it was really encouraging to see Career Source there, Pinellas County School Board, yeah, our exactly. workforce, all there to have this real time response yeah. to employers' needs. Yeah. I think once, I mean, our goal would be twofold, right? From a workforce mm -hmm. academy standpoint, sure. we're increasing our workforce numbers and serving the community, but on the other hand, it would direct, hopefully have a direct positive impact yeah. on I, this. Yes. I agree, I just wanna get back to the point where, you know, the reason that we're in, the, I keep, I told this story a hundred times, and I'll tell it a hundred times more, I just wanna get back to the point to where we are known for getting people to work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, that was the whole discussion. Evelyn Bilirakis, and Carl and I were sitting in, in the governor's office, 
The University of Florida told them, give them a million dollars and they'll study how many nurses they can produce. And Dr. Cutler stepped right up and said, look, give me a half a million dollars and I'll produce you nurses in two years. And that's what we got to get back to mm -hmm. in terms of workforce and make sure that we um, that we are looked to. Mm -hmm. You know, we were sought after at that particular point to like, how do you resolve these issues? And that's what we want to get back to. And I think that will help with enrollment Absolutely. a lot. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Okay, moving on to old business. <coughs> and at the last meeting, we discussed um, the timing of the completion of the Student Success Center, and we have an update on that. Ms. Gardner, can I yes. ask you to give us that update? Certainly. Um, so we did have uh, this come up on the agenda of our special meeting, December 17th concerning the update of the Student Success Center, St. Pete Gibbs. Um, there was a motion to continue the discussion, to table it uh, to this meeting to allow uh, Lima Construction the, um, the time and ability to, uh, to update the board on the project and uh, to lay out their new updated schedule and to give us assurances on <coughs> the completion of the project within the construction budget. So there is a proposed amendment to the agreement that uh, does have those dates in it. Um, and there's also a presentation from Lima this morning um, from its president, uh, Mr. Stanton, as well as um, project manager, Greg Hayes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stanton, thank you for being here. I think I want to compliment both um, <coughs> Mr. Stanton and the staff over the course of the past month um, really moving the ball from where it was um, back in May when we knew there was a delay, but the delay wasn't necessarily quantified or, or um, there, there wasn't a lot of clarity about how it was going to be remedied, and which hence was the reason we had to have that discussion last month. And so in the past month, um, both Lima and the staff has worked hard to put together this proposed amendment to the contract that's coming before the board. Hopefully you all had a chance to see it. Um, it extends the uh, substantial completion date and waives li liquidated damages until the new date. So it basically is just pushing everything out. It, um, so that's what's on the table today. We did still want um, Mr. Stanton to give us an overview because he especially, I want, um, he has a really good drone video and y'all are going to be thrilled at, at what everything <laughs> looks like. So. So right, good, morning. good morning, um, good morning, trustees and Dr. Lanza. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Stanton. I'm the president of uh, Lima Construction. Um, I don't know if all the trustees know, but uh, Lima, we built this building for the college. We had the privilege of building this building. I think we finished it in 2016. Um, and I think um, Kevin Gorham was a provost at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Law allowed him to pick the colors of the outside of the building. And so he was saying, I want this building to be different from mm -hmm. anything around here. And when you come down 22nd, I want it to stick out. And I want nothing like it. So he selected the colors, and we started painting the building. And then uh, Johnny Ruth Carr came over and said, hey, we really like those colors of that building. And they asked for our collection, <laughs> and they started incorporating to their building. And somebody came down from there. So. That was a little funny story about <laughs> this building. Um, you allowed him to put a little too many Florida State colors on the inside. <laughs> I don't think he had, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's more the outside. Um, so uh, I'm the Student Service Center. Um, you know, we were fortunate to be selected um, uh, for this design deal project. And when you're selecting a firm and you're doing a job, um, three things are really important, the quality, uh, the budget, the money, and then also the time. Uh, I want to tell you that the quality of this building is, is immaculate. Um, our design team and the inspection process, we've had over 500 inspections. Um, it's going really well, so everything uh, in this building is, is first class. Uh, the schedule, our original schedule, we wanted to be done by the end of 19. Uh, that didn't happen, um, and that's going to get pushed out, and, and I'll have a schedule to, to talk about that. Uh, but the budget, um, which is the money, you know, which is very important, uh, we're not asking the college for any money. We're able to finish this project within uh, the, the money that we have in the budget. A little different pockets, 
Uh, we're not spending as much money um, on our insurance budget, our bond budget, some of our general conditions. So when you take all those and put it together, that's enough money to finish the project. We were just looking for money to pay for the people, but uh, we're covered for that. So we're not asking the college for any more magic money. Do you use this thing or do you change it? Okay. Um, this is our a P6 schedule that we use. Um, but if you can see at the top, we still have some site work to get done. We have a, a turnaround that we're going to try to do over spring break. I think that's March 6th for the college. Um, if you look kind of in the center, we have a lot of finishes going on between February and March. Uh, but in the middle, you see windows, glass, and glazing. Um, we have uh, 12 interior fire rated doors. Um, and there's only two manufacturers in the United States that make interior fire rated doors. And this was a SREF requirement. Those doors are $300,000 for 12 doors, fire glass rated doors. Um, so when they went into production, uh, the college has a certain lock and mechanisms that they want to use. Uh, so the manufacturer stopped the production to make sure, because these doors were so expensive, that they wanted to get it right. You don't want to build 12 doors for 300,000, ship them to be wrong. So the production got stopped. So that, that hurt us. So that and some of the finishes. So we're um, doing a lot of the finish work in February and March. Um, and if you go down towards the bottom where it says substantial completion, uh, the end of April, we're going to be doing test and balance. Everything's going to be done. Um, and then beginning of May, we're going to work with the college to get them moved in and just going through punch list items. Um, and then should be ready by June 1st. I feel really confident in the schedule, so confident that um, in this uh, amendment that I did sign, if we are past April 30th, then uh, Lima would be paying liquidated damages. So that would become money out of our pocket. So um, time is of the essence, obviously. Um, but when it's done, uh, I think this building is going to be, I hate to say it, but your best looking building, the top, um, you know, right on that Eagle Lake. You know, when we designed this, um, a lot of the students said they want to incorporate the lake. So the, the, the light shining off the lake coming in 66th Street, I think it's going to be great uh, eye-catching uh, for the college. OK, no? That's coming. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, it was your draw. I had a, uh, yeah, it was like MP4 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a drone video. We send monthly updates. Uh, this is from December, so this is not January. Um, but where you see all that yellow is that's where all the ACM blue uh, wall panel is going to go. So you see some of it. Um, and that banding is done up there. Uh, the scaffolding's down. Um, all the glass is installed. The only glass left is those interior uh, 12 doors. Um, we're going to pull out our trailer, I think, uh, by the end of the month, maybe first week of February. So we're going to get our trailer out of there. We're just going to drop in a little smaller one uh, in a little different part of the parking lot. So when you get rid of your trailer, you know, and you don't have this big trailer, a lot of the employees, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not sure. I got to get going. You know, the job's really ending. So it's going to have more of a feel. So um, it's a great project. And um, we're going to be really proud when it's going to be finished. And I think you guys are going to be really proud as well. Thank you. Nice. Um, nice. So before us is an amendment to the existing contract to extend. Madam Chair, let me ask date. a quick question. Sure. Um, I know that Mr. Stanton said that he did not. I know we were in dispute over an amount. I think it was like 138 or something like that. Um, I know that he said that he didn't want that money, but I don't want this coming back to the board. So I would want to offer to the amendment. I mean, amendment to the amendment to ask that we put that in a contingency somewhere so that it does not, if, it, if we do run over, uh, this doesn't have to come back to the board again. I, I, I want to be done with this, and I'm sure that he's going to stay on timelines and all this other stuff, but I don't want to deal with the finances of this again. And, you know, honestly, $140,000 uh, is not a lot of money. I just thought I'd, I'd rather put it in some type of contingency either owners or our contingency to make sure that it can be released if we need it. Um, so that's my motion. If it dies, it dies. And that's okay. But 
I just wanted to be on the record. No, I, I appreciate that. I guess from my standpoint, I think the first draft of this amendment included that and through a lot of discussions over the past several weeks um, that came out. And so it was my understanding that it wouldn't be necessary. And, and so. Yeah, um, one thing I could share is that, um, you know, in our budget, the college still has their owner's contingency separate out of our money that we play with. And I think that there's still $90,000 in owner contingency that you guys still have there. That's not a zero. So um, I feel that's enough for the college side, you know, to have that 90000 plus our money in our bu bucket. So um, I, I feel we're, 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 I mean, I feel we're solid. And, and I don't know if everybody knows that, but there's still 90000 in owner contingency. Thank you. So if there's a second for Trustee Gibbons' motion, or we could have an alternative motion. I'm looking over here, since I can't move for anything. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I was under the understanding that that that, that was removed. But mm -hmm. um, so uh, it sounds like you're OK with that. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, right now, but you know, I, sounds I feel like, like you're yeah. worried. You're saying right now. Right. I don't want to get another month down the road and then we find something else that's wrong or we got to fix or come. I, uh, trustees, I don't want to deal with this issue anymore. If we're going to put the, re if we put the resources in a contingency, we still, the, the president and her staff still have the authority to say yay or nay on whether or not they move it forward to Mr. Stanton uh, based upon what happens. Here's what I would tell you. I, I just don't think it, it, we need to be going back and forth about this. We should put it, all the resources, where they can be utilized and give the president discretion to work with Mr. Stanton and her staff to work with Mr. Stanton if it's necessary and needed, not to keep coming back to the board. Because if you keep coming back here, it only delays us more time. So if, if that was asked for in the beginning, I understand that he's saying he doesn't need it. But if I was in his shoes, I'd be saying that too. You know why? Because it looks better. And then if something happens and we're dealing with this issue all over again in May. Well, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your point. I feel, I, I respectfully disagree. I feel like months ago, Dr. Williams came to me and said, for X amount of money, can we resolve it? And I said, yes, let's do it. Yeah. And over the course of that time, numbers have been crunched, schedules yeah. have been pushed back, sure. and we've moved forward to resolve it. And while I, I also, Believe me, a year ago when we amended the contract um, last time, I said I don't ever want to see this contract back again. So <laughs> I'm doing. It. So I certainly don't want yeah, to. Yeah, because um, But I also um, am disappointed that we're five months late, and um, mm -hmm. and uh, think we should stick with what we have. And we have a contract. We have a number. We've, I mean, we have beat this to death. And I know Mr. Sure. Stanton's beat it to death with um, our staff and the numbers. And I saw some of the email correspondence. And um, if we have our contractor and our staff coming to us with an amendment that has been discussed for the past uh, several weeks um, and negotiated, I, I feel like that's what we should do is take the recommendation sure. of the two parties. I'm, I'm, I'm not disappointed that we're five months late. I'm disappointed that it took us this long to get together and sit in a room and figure it out, more than being five months late. So I, I think there's, there's fault to blame on both sides, honestly. And then we're not here to, to, to shed that out today. We're not going to have that No, we're not here to hash that out. But at the same time, let's just be realistic. Uh, you know, Everybody has a plan, and then it starts, you know, until you get punched in the mouth, right? Wow. You, go, you go in the boxing match, you say, I'm going to win, right? And then you get hit, and you got to start changing a little bit. So um, I guess I, further, I, I, I'm not I, necessarily I, comfortable I, with that, since we have no plan as to where that money is coming from. Listen, it died where for lack it, of a, I, Madam Chair, it's died for a lack of a second. Well, it's already dead. Yeah, we don't know that it is or it, not. They didn't. They didn't, but, they didn't give a second. It's OK. It's dead for a lack of a second. But what I will tell you is, you know, I'm just telling you, I don't want to see this again. And I want to make sure that we have given every opportunity to the president and her staff to be to move the process forward I think we and not bring that. it back. I disagree that, that we've done that, but OK. That's the board's will. We're exactly where I hoped we would be and where I recommended at the last meeting. So I move that we accept and move on. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, 
<laughs> Moving on to new business, there's a number of administrative matters um, that were included in your packet, including a personnel report and the stop loss policy. Does anyone have any questions about those? We need um, action on those. We can move forward and look at grants and restricted funds contract, and we can take them all at once, if that's your pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. If grants and restricted funds contract, there's a challenge grant with Educate Tomorrow. Any questions? And uh, amendment to the spot survey with Tarpon Springs and Allstate. Take it all at once, if I hear a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Thank you. Um, informational reports, um, contracts, exempt and non-exempt purchases, contracts exceeding a certain threshold. I'd especially like to call your attention to the DSO reports. Again, I certainly appreciate each of the direct service organizations including these reports in our monthly agenda. Um, the college does so much, and we get into the weeds sometimes about, which we should, about student success. Sometimes we lose the focus of all of the other things we're doing in the community to really impact the community for the positive, and um, our DSOs are certainly an example of that. So, um, any other questions? Hearing none, Dr. Williams, your report? Yeah, I, again, just want to thank everybody for the help um, legislatively. And um, we have a, a good opportunity this year with our legislators to mm -hmm. significantly support the state colleges. And um, I was asked by um, the uh, Senate president what would be our preference, operational funds um, or uh, performance. And I said operational. Um, all state colleges are working very hard to get operational dollars, and we're working as a team to uh, try to get $50 million for state colleges this year to divide according to um, need and effectiveness. So we've got two ways that we're being funded, or has been recommended that we're being funded this year. One is by growth. So it's looking at those colleges that grow at a higher Rate. Thank you. Those colleges that grow at a higher rate will receive more funds to support them out of their growth. This is an area that SPC must roll its sleeves up and make happen. So I'm meeting with the deans every Friday because we are going to create that new <coughs> schedule. We are going to get those new programs and we're going to review what we, what we have and what's not going well and shave them off. So this is the year for action. For fall, the schedule will roll out. It will be brand new. It will be different. And so the deans and I have had our first meeting. It was very productive. And we're going to move forward. If growth is what they're looking at, then we need to be growing. Second, they were looking at a performance-based funding model. That model is twofold. One part of that model talks about how many of our students are graduating and our completion rates. We'll need to work on that. And then how many students stay year over year. Those are the two areas that we need to be focusing on. So legislatively, we need to do it. But for our citizens in our community, we need to do that. So that's going to be our focus and, and where we're headed. I'll be back in Tallahassee Monday through Thursday of next week. The thrill. Mm -hmm. um, but the thrill of that will be I'll be with Leadership SPC, which is going to be great. Um, and I'll also be with our students. Um, it'll be their student trip. We decided to make this a SPC week. Um, and we'll have our uh, great employees and our students there. And um, I'll be there also meeting with our legislators and other um, interest groups. So um, let's keep moving and we'll, we'll make it happen. Thank you for your support as a board. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Very good. Is there any other business by the board for today? No, we'll stay after. We have a presentation uh, with Verizon. Um, I believe that is upstairs. Or is it in the lobby? It's in the lobby. So we'll Great. see you out there. Trustee Gibbons, you're on. Wonderful. We're adjourned. Thank you.